Hey guys, what's going on? It's Don here from Nova Spirit Tech and welcome back to the channel. And today we are going to be taking a look at the official Ubuntu 2010 desktop edition for Raspberry Pi 4. So let's get started. <laughs> Now, it's no big surprise that they're actually going to come out with the desktop version because we actually been doing this on the Ubuntu server 2004 for quite some time now. And as a matter of fact, if you've seen my previous video, I did a full desktop install on the server. So if you guys want to check that out, I'll leave a link on the top left and down in the description below as well. Now, I am glad that they are actually coming out with the desktop version and they are actually fully supporting it for at least nine months, which means any bugs that we find in the future will get fixed. Now, to get this installed into your Raspberry Pi, it's pretty simple. There's actually two ways to do this. One way is that you could head right over to their website and you could download the image and you could use Etcher or Raspberry Pi Imager to burn the image into your SD card or your SSD. Or if you just download the Raspberry Pi Imager, you go to the other option where it says Ubuntu and in there you could download the 2010 desktop edition for the Raspberry Pi 4 so you don't even have to go through the website. Now that's the method that I did and, and right now I'm burning it into an SD card just to show you the initial setup but I will show you my current configurations for the 2010 desktop. Once you're done burning it to the SD card and you boot it up for the first time, you will be presented with a system configuration menu where you can set up your username and everything. So we're going to go through that right now. So I'm going to choose English, English again, US, US. Okay. Uh, New York. That's correct. And here you can set up your username. I'm just going to call it Pi. And I'm going to call this R Pi UBU Pi password and log in automatically so here you could actually use active directory if you have active directory at home that's the new thing about 2010 right now with the new gnome 3.38 active directory is available as well as fingerprint if you do have a finger fingerprint scanner on your laptop or something like that it is supported now right around here it takes about like a couple of minutes for it to configure everything and then it'll just boot into your desktop afterwards so just leave this alone and let it do its thing Uh, now that that is all done, uh, we're going to be presented with this first welcome screen. I'm going to skip that. I don't want to send system info. Uh, turn off location services. It shows you the amount of apps that you could install. And that is it for now. So this is the stock GNOME look. And you guys know if I modify this, I don't generally follow this look, which I don't mind it, but it's just I don't use it like this. And a couple of new things that they did add into GNOME 3.38 is the ability to actually like folderize everything. You could put it into folders like this. And if you pop into there, you could actually still rename the folder if you wanted to. And everything's categorized like that. They got rid of the frequent used uh, applications on the bottom, which is something I did as well because that was really useless. And um, yeah, as far as looks go, it looks like that. Now, I'm going to pull up System Monitor. So let me see. System monitor and there is a one update already okay i'll remind that later uh, as far as resources go on the first boot you are shy of a little bit under a gig which is 930 which is actually is a little bit lower because normally on a gnome setup i would see one or 1 1.2 gigs uh first fresh boot so that's pretty good another thing that you're going to start realizing is that um biggest thing that i found which is great for ubuntu being on Raspberry Pi now is that we actually get VC gen command. And also if we were to do sudo app install rpi, look at this. We have the EEPROM program that we could download as well as the rpi GPIO. And if I go over to Python 3 uh, rpi, we also get the Python 3 rpi GPIO. These are the things that you couldn't find originally on the server install of Ubuntu for Raspberry Pi. Now that we have access to this stuff and being able to use the 40 pin headers on a Ubuntu install, that is great. Without having to jump hoops, you know, you, we could have done it before, but we had to jump hoops just to get it to work. Now on a stock installation, um, I did see other people's videos where they were having issues with loading videos. So I'm going to take a look at this. Now I am on a 720 screen right now. Uh, I could change it to 1080, but I don't think I need to. It's just um, my HDMI recorder default to 720 all the time and swapping it back and forth is a little bit annoying but let's pop over to youtube it is a little slow on loading right now i am on the four gigabyte and 1.5 gigahertz no overclock or anything so let's take a look at this video um all right seems to be loading i'm not having any issues i'm going to skip this ad it loaded probably dropped one frame over here 
So stats for nerds. Nope, zero drop frames. Looks pretty good. Let me see. It's on headset right now. Pop into settings, go into sound. Can I switch it over to HDMI? To grab the there you go. libraries directly using app. In three, yeah, okay, so I'm not dropping any frames right here. Everything looks pretty good. So I if I was to switch to over to 720. Guys, what's the difference between this nope. and OpenGL? That seems to be looking pretty good as well. Frame drift flips. I don't, let me and switch to 1080 and see if there, that has a problem. Starting with GLX gears. So uh, GLX zero drop gears. frames. Now this is a open It looks fine. I mean, gears. that was one of the things I was watching other people's second, videos. They were saying ha they're having issues watching videos. Maybe they right have an older there. version it's and like it's fixed on this newer version. Right? Um, it, now, I don't seem to be having that issue at all. Demos that we have. I'm going to close this tab. Another thing to check is um, if you go down settings, uh, we did check just a second ago that you could choose between the two audios. Um, Backgrounds, I did find something funny is that they did have an actual gorilla background, so I thought that was cool. But I do like, I like what they shipped. I like this background that they have right now, which is the gorilla one, and also this background. I could do a lot with this background. So I do like the default backgrounds that they send this time. As far as appearance goes, uh, we do have the dark theme and the light theme if we needed to. Uh, notifications, search. Oh, if you're going to use this, remember to disable all this search because when you pull up your application menus just to go through this, it's a lot of basically buffering that you need. A lot of wasted uh, CPU just to open your applications menu because it's trying to search for stuff. Um, sharing, VNC is enabled, so I could actually like turn this on and use it for VNC. Power, does power work? I could see my keyboard and mouse, blank the screen. Uh, no suspend or anything. Okay. Displays here. I could change the display to 1080 if I wanted to. Uh, refresh rates. Um, users. Activity account. I could check out their stuff. Okay. I mean, there's nothing crazy new about it other than the fact that you could do this on AD. Uh, it has the support for audio and all that stuff. So it seems to work pretty well right now uh, as a stock installation, including the fact that we get a couple of the programs that we would not normally see, which is VC gen command. Anyway, I'm going to switch over to my other desktop that I have everything all configured to show you what I've done. So give me one second. All right, and here we go. So this is the version that I've actually been playing over the weekend. So if you've been following me on Twitter, you would see a lot of my pictures popping up of what I've been doing. Now, in the previous video, you guys kept asking me what SSD connector I'm using to connect to the Pi, which is uh, this guy right here connected to my 500 gigabyte SSD. And this one has its own self-powered. It has uh, multiple connectors and stuff like that, which I'll leave a link down in the description below. And I know this one works because I've been using it. Anyway, pop over to my desktop. I actually switched over to a 1080 screen so you guys could see how nice it looks, I guess. And as well as um, dash to panel. That's a thing that I like to use a lot. And it gives me like a start menu feel type thing, a Windows 7 type feel because I like the task manager on the bottom. Um, moving on. I did add this little um, CPU frequency controller and this one allows me to adjust the minimum clock to one gigahertz, which gives me this responsiveness on this system. So uh, keeping it at 600, gig 600 megahertz, which is default, is a little bit too slow for the ramp up. So I tend to just keep it at one gigahertz because everything just feels much better. I also have a blurred background. Uh, so you can see it's um, blurred bash or uh, bash to blur or something. I forgot what it's called, but you know what? I have a github on my 20.04 setup and i've actually updated it for this as well so i'll leave a link to that github so you know what configurations i kind of did and uh moving on i did get uh steam working which is box 86 um that works perfectly fine and again let me see if i can show you guys here's a little trick if you don't remember the command instead of hitting up arrow for like a hundred times you could do control r and a reverse search your history and then you just type steam and I that's my command. I could just hit it, enter, and it'll run it. Because I know you need to run the Steam OS equals one and all that other stuff to get it working. So here we go. Um, it is in small picture mode. Uh, that's the only way I could view all this stuff. Um, on the latest release on Box86, you can actually do big picture mode and it works. So I could actually use that to uninstall games and stuff like that. 
So I'm going to install Fast and Light, which is a quick game to download and also to test. So I'm going to drop that in there. And to download, it should be pretty quick since I have it cached on my uh, Synology NAS right now. And there we have it. We just finished installing. And I'm going to hit Play Game. And it should just boot right up. There we have it. Obviously, I'm not going to be playing it, so I'm just going to leave this as is. I'm going to close this out. So I'm going to show you guys Vulkan, and I could do VK Cube over here, and Vulkan is installed and is running. So I managed to get the two things I needed, which is Box86 and Vulkan. So if I had some Vulkan games to put in here, I can. And I also dropped in uh, VS Code with all the plugins that it needs to actually run Python with GPIO. So I did do a little little test code over here. You could see RPI GPIO, and if I needed to like really code, I could code in this GPIO dot, and then it should have my autocomplete in here. You see that board BCM high low output stuff like that. So yeah, um, it works really well. I'm still playing around with it, and there's still a few things I want to test to throw at it to see if certain things work or certain things don't work. Well, in conclusion, will this replace my Raspberry OS? And the short answer is no. And that's because the Raspberry Pi OS is just built for using the Raspberry Pi, which gives you the better performance and also all the programs that you need to interface with the GPIOs and everything you need. Now, if you were to ask me what desktop I would choose to actually use it like a computer, uh, hands down, actually Ubuntu 2010 or 2004 would be great because I got the 64-bit with the 64-bit user land. As far as stability goes, I haven't had any issues with it other than when I first tried to install it over the weekend, I didn't have my sound card working, but eventually I just had to reinstall it and I was able to get that to go. Same thing with the overclock. Uh, it was crashing on me when I was overclocked, but I think that might have been a bad image. That's why I was having so much issues with it initially. After reinstalling everything, I was able to get everything up and going. The sound card was working, overclocking was working. Um, right now, I've been using this guy on 1.5 gigahertz just to give it the benefit of the doubt. Yes, on 2 gigahertz, it would probably be much snappier like I was on the 20.4. But again, they built this for the Raspberry Pi with 1.5 on its mind so i was using everything on 1.5 and it seems to be pretty responsive i mean there's some times where i felt like it should have been a little bit more especially when you're doing like some browsing with the firefox definitely felt like i really needed a little bit more horsepower to get those to be a little bit quicker and i was testing actually between the four gigabytes and the eight gigabytes and i actually did not find any performance hits wise like it didn't really matter if it was for eight gigabytes i was able to use it just as smooth so obviously having eight gigabytes should be better to for multitasking if you're going to run multiple programs but it doesn't hinder the performance if you're not going to be doing that much and one more thing i do like is that i didn't have to go through hoops just to get the ssd to boot like on 20.04 like uncompressing the kernel and stuff like that this one worked right off the bat and that's what i mean by when they start supporting these things things will just start working Anyway, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please hit that like button. If you guys got any questions about this or want me to test specific things, let me know down in the comments below. And if you guys are new to this channel, consider subscribing and also hitting that bell notification icon so you know when the next video is going to be out. And as I say in my nerd cave, hack till it hurts.